Hello and a huge warm welcome to everyone here for the second day of Change Now. It's great to be here in person to see so many of you here. Uh, my name's Anna Stewart. I'm a CNN reporter. I cover European business. And today I get to be your host for this session, which is on fostering collaboration. We have a host of excellent panelists, all with very different scopes. So I think we'll really get to the heart of different issues around collaboration. How can businesses from startups to entrepreneurs to huge corporations successfully and efficiently work together to achieve more. So really a holistic concept of business, I guess, where the whole is actually greater than the sum of its parts. Now, this is going to be split into three. I know some of you are familiar with all of this. Um, but without further ado, I will welcome our first guest, Crystal Haderman, the new CEO of Orange Group. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome and Thank congratulations you. on your new job. Only in it since April. How's it going so far? So far, so good. It's been, a, it's been a journey, but actually I know the company quite well. I was a, a member of the board of directors for five years. And, uh, and I spent, actually, I started my career in the telecom industry as a supplier of Orange. So Orange was my customer, and, and I'm very proud to now be joining this company that's fantastic, that's super engaged, and very committed to being a, a sustainable player in the digital world. You're certainly no stranger to telecoms, to Orange, but now all of the problems are, are your problems. But well, first of all, while you're in the honeymoon phase of your new job title, why don't you give us an idea of your mission statement? Because you must be bringing new ideas, new passions, a new outlook to Orange. What's your plan? So Orange, first of all, we have, a, I mean, I'm still listening a lot. And I'm meeting, and I've been traveling. And, and, and it's very important for me to understand. I mean, France is a very, it's the core, it's a historical uh, business of Orange. And so obviously, I've met with the people in the field. But I'm also traveling, because Orange, 265 million customers, <laughs> half, of, half of them in Africa. So I was in Morocco last week, and, I'm, and I plan to visit. We have 18 countries where we operate in Africa. And it's very important for me to make sure that I really understand how it's like to be an employee of Orange, even if we are very far from headquarters, and a customer of Orange when we are not in the mainstream company that obviously people know in France. Uh, so I'm listening a lot. We have a number of very important projects ongoing that I'm obviously carrying, and I want to make sure that we, we execute them as, as planned. And obviously, I'm working on, on our vision on, on a very ambitious strategy for the company. We are a telecom operators, so the digital world, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about the pandemic and the, Im and the impact that had on networks. Uh, so we play a critical role, and we also need to make sure we understand in that massive digital ecosystem that changed a lot in the past 15 years and that will continue to change because of the way we consume uh, digital technologies. Uh, so we need to make sure that we position as a leader and that we, we innovate. I mean, technology innovation has always been at the core of the Orange brand. And the Orange brand is a real asset for our company. So we want to make sure that we continue to be the pioneer of the telecom industry. And that if we look at 2030, we want to be the leader, I mean, in Europe, in Africa, uh, and bring the best of what uh, digital technologies can bring to, to customers. And you want to deliver the best product for your customer. You want to deliver value for shareholders. But you also have to deliver on some really ambitious net zero targets. Net zero by 2040, I think. And you've actually got a deadline coming up much sooner in 2025. Yeah. How easy will it be to meet that? Are you on track for these targets? So the, this commitment to being the trusted partner of a sustainable and responsible digital world is actually our purpose. And it's now written in the, in the, in the, company, uh, in the company DNA. So indeed, uh, me, making sure that we educate customers on the impact on the environment of consuming digital technology is very important. Making sure, and we started already many years back on making sure that we, we drive efficiency in our networks, in our IT platforms. That's tough because we have to cope with the exponential growth of traffic while making sure that we actually drive toward net neutrality net carbon neutrality in 2040, which is a commitment that we've made. 
in 2025, we want to make sure that we've reduced 30% our scope one and two carbon emissions compared to 2015. Scope one and scope two, this is oranges, this is direct our emissions. Direct emissions, so that means uh, the energy we consume and, and the direct and, and the type of energy. And so we are working hard on efficiency first. We're, we're working hard on making sure that we consume renewable energy so we can decarbonize the energy we consume. So in Africa, for instance, we've, we've in invested in solar farms uh, to produce uh, zero carbon energy for, for our network. But we also work hard on making sure that consumers and enterprise customers understand how to be responsible when we use digital tools. And, and today, I mean, we are launching here our, our program around, because ma most of our carbon emissions are actually in our scope three, like most companies. 80% of our carbon emissions are in scope three. And if we look today at the, the digital ecosystem, mobile phones are not recycled, they're not collected. So we started in France last year, we launched a program that's called RE, R -E, RE for recycle, repair, collect phones. And we've moved the needle because we moved from 13% collection to 23%, but we still have a long way to go. And if we look today at the mobile phone industry, only one to 2% of the entire phones are really collected, recycled. Not only this is important because that's the only way we'll be able to, to move to the 20, 2050 ultimate net carbon uh, uh, neutrality on the planet. And for us, uh, we have this commitment in, uh, in 2040. But that's also important because if we look at resources, I mean, biodiversity, there's probably more available metals, minerals in the entire mobile phones that are today circulating on the planet the ground. that we have under the ground. And so when today we're looking at and we're discussing about sovereignty, independence uh, towards resources, I mean, this is something that at European level we are addressing. This is something that most government, governments are, tr are trying to address. But it really requires, and coming back to the topic of this discussion, collaboration across different industries, uh, across different players. And how challenging is that, collaborating with your rivals, essentially? It's not just with uh, rivals, it's with our partners, because first of all, I mean, mobile phone suppliers are partners of us. Other mobile, I mean, other telecom players, they're also partners, because first of all, we have relationships. When you, when you travel and you roam to another network, we have agreements behind. So there's also, the telecom industry is probably the industry that's the most organized to collaborate. We have the GSMA, the association that's driving collaboration. We are used to developing standards that allow you actually to travel and to use the same mobile phone and to have the same network standards, etc. So this is an industry that's used to collaboration. Now we have to collaborate when we talk about recycling mobile phones. That means really first educating customers, working on the, on the right programs. That's what we are doing at, at Orange. And we really want to make it a competitive advantage because we are convinced that consumers want to do good. The, the other thing we, we started to do is to make sure that when people look at their mobile app as a customer, so the Orange mobile app, they can see their carbon emissions. And I'm really convinced that everyone, I mean, this event is called Change Now because everyone wants to act, everyone wants to change. And so it really starts by providing the right information, educating customers, educating consumers, enterprise customers on, on how to change. And, and, and there's not one magic solution to carbon neutrality. It's thousands, millions, billions of mini actions that will make it happen. I think it's really inspiring to hear that you're looking at the chain all the way down to the consumer and the end of life of the phone. Um, let's look at the last couple of years. Pretty challenging, I think we can all agree, but an absolute explosion in demand for broadband. I mean, we were all living and working online. Was it hard to keep up? So it was, I mean, for our Orange employees, I mean, remember when countries one after the other moved to, to lockdown, we saw the traffic, I mean, in, in Europe, plus 30% traffic actually on our network. We know that people working from homes were multiplied by seven. And the network resisted to that. And we supported many, many organizations, actually, to move to using digital technology. But thank God the network was there, because otherwise, I mean, children couldn't have uh, followed on education. Companies needed the network to continue to operate.
And you have to stay so flexible and ready as a telecoms company. And demand must keep going with virtual reality, with AR, with all of these new technologies. So we, we have to, I mean, we invest a lot in our networks. And actually, one of our questions for our industry is that if you look at the traffic in, in Europe or the traffic on our network at Orange, 55% of the traffic comes from very few players. So you would know them. <laughs> you would know them. But that, that raises a question, because we invest billions, actually, in our network every year. Same is true for our other, other telecom operators in Europe. Now, if we look at the value chain, and, and, and there's typically there's something that we should discuss, and I know that at EU level, this is something that's being discussed, because clearly, we invest a lot for a value that's captured by other players. Right. Um, let's look at the telecom space in Europe. This is not for the faint-hearted. This is a really competitive, difficult sector with a lot of consolidation. In the UK this week, even, Vodafone is under a lot of pressure. It says it's seeking multiple deals. With Orange, I know, and we'll get on to your merger in Spain, but what about in France? Would you ever consider consolidation at this stage? So that's a question that I get all the time I from, uh, from media <laughs> in France. There, there's been discussion five years back in the, in the French uh, ecosystem, so the, the, four, the four mobile and fixed operators, because France is a, is a convert main mobile and, and telecom uh, operators. Uh, currently, I mean, there's no plan to consolidate. Uh, if there were any, uh, any way, we would be involved in the, in the discussion simply because uh, the market is, is, uh, is uh, somehow established and we have relationship with all of them. Uh, but I would not bet on the strategy for Orange that relies on the consolidation in France because, I mean, you know, this type of thing can happen, cannot happen, but if, if opportunities happen, we will for sure discuss and, and, uh, and, and look at them. To me, it seems a difficult market for four players. I can see there being three, but we'll have to keep an eye, I think, on it. That's not what the regulators think. <laughs> well, that's a different question altogether. That is not what the regulators think. And, 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 and to be fair, if you look at the four operators in France, there's, it's not in some markets, and actually five years back when, when uh, the discussion started, the economics of operators were not stable, and, and some of them were really destabilized. So that's why we got the situation. I, I don't think any of the operators today are in a, in a critical situation financially, economically. Uh, and, and so that's typically one trigger for this type of, uh, of discussion. But you're right that if we look at Europe, 90 operators in Europe compared to three in the US and three in China, there's for sure something that's not driving the, the, the economic value of our industry in Europe. I imagine that will change in the coming years. Let's talk about the merger that is happening, MassMobile in Spain. Is that on track? And what sort of value will that bring to Orange? So we are very happy to have signed this, uh, I mean, we signed uh, exclusivity uh, discussion uh, agreement. So we are now in the process of, uh, of uh, finalizing the agreement so that we could officially have a signed agreement by summertime. Then the, the closing of the transaction would depend on the approvals of uh, EU, I mean, uh, obviously antitrust and, and administration approval, which would happen uh, later in uh, 23, so mid-23, we, we think. So everything is moving as planned. We're still in negotiation, and so we operate as competitors in, uh, in Spain, of course, MassMobile and, and, and Orange. But, but the, uh, the objective for us, I mean, Spain is a, is a crowded market. It's not uh, there are... 11 operators actually uh, in Spain and so we are trying to combine with a player to create a leader in Spain who would have the ability to invest because we still need to invest a lot in fiber technology in 5G in Spain and so by combining MassMobile and Orange we aim at, at creating efficiency that would allow us to invest more in the infrastructure in Spain. Now, before I let you go, because it's incredible how time is running out already, um, let's talk about growth markets outside of these tricky mature markets in Europe. Where do you see growth? So there, I mean, for us, Africa, Middle East and Africa has been, uh, uh, I mean, we've been in, in, uh, in the continent for quite some time. We now operate in uh, 18 countries. We have 135 million customers. So we are the third operator in Africa. A and this is a, this is a, a, a fantastic uh, success for us. Uh, we grew 10% last year in Africa and we continue to grow. And the, the growth is driven by mobile data, fixed, uh, fixed broadband, 
uh, the B2B market as well. A and so we, we plan to continue to invest massively in this continent and to continue to, to grow. And we have fantastic teams. We are local. I mean, our headquarters for Africa are based in Morocco. But then we operate in Senegal, Ivory Coast, Egypt, Botswana. I could go on, 18 countries. <laughs> and we have fantastic local teams there who build aggressive, ambitious plans. And, and we plan to support them. You've got a lot of places to go, I think, uh, in your first year as CEO. Chris Lahidman, it's absolute pleasure to have you here on stage. Thank Great you. to meet you. And I'm sure we'll be uh, catching up before we know it. Chris Lahidman, everyone, thank you very much. Thank you.